Hello. This is the SIG multi-cluster intro and deep dive. I'm Paul Mori. I'm Jeremy Olmsted Thompson, and I work on uh, GKE at Google. And I'm Laura Lorenz. I also work on GKE at Google. So we're going to cover a lot today. We're going to cover what is this SIG about? We're going to talk about areas of current activity like cluster set, namespace, sameness, cluster ID and cluster set membership, the multi-cluster services API and multi-cluster DNS and more. We're also going to have a deep-ish dive uh, that covers multi-cluster services API, cluster ID and multi-cluster DNS. And finally, we'll talk about how you can contribute and be involved with our SIG. So let me share first what this SIG is all about. Uh, the whole idea is we're asking ourselves what should be the Kubernetes native way to do things like expose workloads from multiple clusters to each other or replicate workloads across clusters or target deployments to specific clusters if you have multiple clusters in a group. So these pressing questions and more are the purview of SIG multi-cluster and it turns out that the work that we do touches many different functional areas, all sorts of different uh, problems. And we also find ourselves collaborating with many other SIGs. Uh, but where we're at right now is working to identify the best, most durable primitives that are going to help us achieve all of these multi-cluster use cases. And we love input and really need your input. Um, when it comes to multi-cluster Setups, real user stories, and use cases are extremely valuable. You know, designing any standard uh, that is extremely valuable. And many of the projects that we have are in alpha stage and are still ma malleable. And we need new tools to expose new needs. So uh, we'll talk about it more when we get to how you can contribute, but we would love to see everybody and hear your multi cluster use cases for the projects we're working on. So let's talk a little bit about our approach. Um, we, we, this is really important to us as a SIG. I think we've, we've seen great progress because of this kind of shift in mindset, but we, we try to avoid premature standardization or, or solving any optional problems. I think in the past, we've maybe tried to reach too far into what could be for multi-cluster instead of, uh, focusing on problems that we knew existed, um, and specific problems that we're seeing in the community that need to be solved now. So that's basically the change is we're trying to instead focus on the specific functionality that we want to build, uh, pay less attention to what could be, but making sure that we're not closing any doors and then uh, kind of work backwards from those problems and see how things evolve into, into bigger and bigger problems. Um, so let's talk about the, uh, the current activity right now in the SIG. So the first thing I want to talk about is the cluster set. And uh, you may have heard us talk about this before. If this is your first time coming to SIG multi-cluster, let's, let's dig in here. Um, cluster set is not an API, it's a concept. Um, we don't really expose it as any resource, but that's changing. We're starting to have some resources that really kind of revolve around the cluster set, but the cluster set basically represents a pattern of use from the field. So historically in Kubernetes, uh, resources within a, within a cluster are not aware of the cluster itself. Um, there's no real concept of a cluster uh, from within the resource model. Um, we're changing that. And so uh, a group of clusters uh, in a cluster set uh, are clusters that are governed by a single authority and have a high degree of trust within a set. You know, if you wouldn't want things in these clusters to talk to each other at all, or even be aware of their existence, it's probably best to keep those clusters separate. This is if you want to, you know, have some coordination between your clusters and, and you know, communication between your clusters. And if you're okay with kind of exposing what goes into the services and whatnot, um, that make up the workloads that uh, uh, run within each cluster, then cluster sets are probably very interesting to you. So with cluster set, we introduce this concept of namespace sameness. Um, and this is that uh, permissions, characteristics, and identity are uh, consistent across uh, clusters um, in a cluster set for each namespace. So foo in the bar namespace uh, in, in one cluster is the same general uh, workload or service in another cluster. Um, and namespaces don't have to exist in every cluster, but for clusters in which they do exist, they behave the same. So that may be that you have a service that exists in multiple clusters in the same namespace, the same name as an extension of that service. Or it may be that you have a namespace in each cluster that is always cluster local and, and never shares any information outside of that cluster and that's okay too. But the idea is that you don't have this kind of mix and match. So it's very predictable 
how, how namespaces are used. And generally, someone with access to a namespace in one cluster should have uh, similar access to that namespace in another cluster. So with the cluster ID, this is kind of the first time we're trying to expose that, that cluster concept um, as a resource. Um, really what we've done is we've introduced this new cluster property CRD, which is basically a name value pair that the idea is that this is a, a resource that you can use to expose cluster level properties. Um, and the, the big one that we're pushing to start with is id.cates.io. So this will be a well-known named uh, cluster property uh, that has the, uh, the discoverable identity of that cluster. So services within that cluster, workloads within that cluster can, uh, can use this resource to figure out, you know, where am I running? Um, we're also introducing the cluster set.cates.io uh, cluster property, which uh, will be the identity of the cluster set um, or at least the way for a cluster to identify the cluster set to which it belongs. So this may be a membership ID for that cluster within the cluster set, or it may be the name of the cluster set itself. Uh, you know, going back to not solving problems we don't need to solve, we're kind of leaving that up to implementations. Um, but the idea is that now a workload will be able to discover uh, which cluster it's running in and, uh, and which cluster set to which it belongs. These, these need to be uh, unique, unique to the cluster uh, uh, within a cluster set for the lifetime of that membership. So basically, as long as you have uh, a cluster belonging to a cluster set, it will have a consistent cluster set ID and it will have a consistent cluster ID. Um, so you'll always be able to identify uh, your, your clusters in that cluster set. And you know these are really to build that reference for multi-cluster tooling um, that we're going to talk about here in a second. So the first big project that we've been working on for a while, and some of you may have heard us talk about this before, is, is the multi-cluster services API. Um, this is basically an extension of the service concept uh, across multiple clusters. I mean, services are the basic way that uh, workloads communicate with each other in, in Kubernetes, and we've extended that across clusters. Um, and so we've just kind of been focusing on uh, just the API and common behaviors uh, that we want to see in services. So we've we've left room for various implementations, and we have some out there. We've got Submariner, uh, GKE has one, and Istio has been developing one as well. Um, we have not built a standard implementation, uh, but we've built an API that we uh, we want you to be able to rely on in no matter which implementation you're using. And this builds on the concept of namespace sameness. So basically, Laura is going to dig into this a little bit more later. But uh, with the multi-cluster services API, we let you stitch services together across clusters simply by using the same name. Um, we've left room for control planes to be centralized or decentralized, depending on your implementation, where things are running, what makes sense. Um, but cluster IP and headless services just work the way they do uh, uh, across cluster, or the way they do in a single cluster, now across clusters. Um, and there are some DNS changes as well involved with this that uh, Laura will talk about as well. But again, all of this is additive, your existing services uh, don't change. And we've been working with other SIGs um, to figure out how this can integrate uh, as well. There's been some work with SIG networking and the Gateway API, um, which plays ni nicely with multi-cluster services as well. So this is really becoming kind of your standard service building block uh, for multi-cluster uh, communication. And now what everyone's been waiting for, the more. All right, here's the more. We got KubeFed, which is preparing for beta. We've got Work API, which is about spreading groups of resources to different clusters. And also recently, we've had some conversations about leader election in the context of services that are running across multiple clusters, considering how this uh, you know, might, uh, might interact with existing work to enhance leader election primitives in Kubernetes, and wondering you know, what SIG multi-cluster should or could recommend or implement as a reference in this area. Um, and I'll just sneak a little call for you to join us if you're interested in that uh, topic as well. All right, so I wanted to take an opportunity to do a little bit of a deep dive, though honestly it might be a little shallow in the sense that I only have so much time. But I've pulled some slides from our past conversations in SIG multi-cluster about MCS API, about cluster property, and about multi-cluster DNS, I'm gonna try and show some of those to you uh, so you can get even more of a feel for them beyond the updates that we just gave. 
So about the MCS API, we talked about it, Jeremy talked about it a bit before, and he mentioned that the idea is that we're broadcasting a service out into other clusters. So of course we've got two boxes here that are two clusters, right? So say you have a service over here in this cluster on the left, if you wanted to get accessibility of that service available over in this cluster on the right, the idea is that this service export um, object that the MCS API describes uh, can be placed in this left cluster, this service import um, resource that the MCS API describes will be generated in this right cluster. And that's gonna connect these two core Kubernetes API objects, the service that you had in your producing cluster and the endpoints or endpoint slices you have in your consuming cluster. So the way that these, the way these actually look, right, uh, from the service export perspective, this is the resource that you as a administrator or um, can, can needing to configure your service to be shared across clusters would actually create either yourself or through some sort of tooling. And so this is a, the, you know, direct point that you'll experience as a user of multi-cluster services. And it's a very simple uh, resource that basically just has a name and a namespace. And the whole point of this is that this name and namespace matches exactly with what this service's name and namespace is. And that marks that this service should be exported from this cluster. So very simple shape here, right? Schema here, um, just to connect these two points. Once that has been marked, then it's up to the MCS controller to generate these service imports in the consuming clusters. So the service import uh, schema here is designed to include all the information that's needed for the consuming clusters to actually consume this as if it was a service that was present there. So it needs to know some information about from the originating service, uh, like what ports it's exposing and other metadata from there. And then it also needs to know how to get to that service from our current location, right? From our right cluster, we need to get to <coughs> we need to get to our left cluster. So it's also going to need to know uh, what the IP is to get there. And in the case of uh, if I was exporting a uh, cluster IP service, then this would be our cluster set IP here. Uh, very similar to how cluster IP services work today. You get one IP that you can load balance in front of. Uh, all the backends from other clusters. So just backing up uh, two slides, just to touch one more time on something that Jeremy mentioned, I'm showing the left to right uh, direction here, um, but you could also have the service in the right cluster, create a service export in the right cluster, and then those backends will also get shared across our cluster set here of two clusters into the left cluster. If you had like a north cluster and a south cluster on this uh, diagram too, they could also all have the same service, all have a service export marking it for export. And then this name and namespace service, the backends in all of these clusters are all considered safe to respond to any request for that service uh, with any of the backends in any of the clusters because of namespace sameness, because we consider those to be functionally identical. So just one other uh, add on uh, from what Jeremy mentioned earlier. So another exciting thing that's going on is the MCS API is being integrated into other um, projects in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So um, Istio is actually taking on a multi-phase approach. I've linked the RFC here if you want to give it a read uh, to integrate the MCS API. And this includes in sort of the later phases to implement a full MCS controller in Istio D. So you could use Istio to um, run your the controller that understands the MCS API standard. And standardizing on this MCS API, it benefits the MCS users because you could upgrade into uh, Istio Service Mesh just naturally if you already were using an MCS API controller that you had an implementation for or you used one of the implementations that exist, but then someday you're like, oh, actually, I want to use this other thing that's in Istio. It could be easy. It is easy for you to upgrade directly uh, into Istio in that case because you're already using an API that it's built on top of. But it's actually also helping the Istio users too. So it simplifies their DNS infrastructure. The way that their Istio DNS infrastructure today is has kind of a couple different options um, or optional uh, things that can run alongside. Um, but if uh, it can use what is described in the MCS API, it kind of simplifies it and uh, unifies it onto this one standard that's already Kubernetes native. And it also allows some flexibility between full service mesh, everything knows everything about everywhere uh, type situation and a more cluster local type service discovery. 
Uh, so the service export concept that we're using in the MCS API for people to opt in to exposing a service from one cluster to the rest um, is also actually useful in Istio to kind of take uh, a step back for users who do want to have some, at least some of that cluster local experience um, and they can use this service export resource that we've described to do that same marking type of um, activity um, so that SCOD can choose uh, between full service mesh exposability or just the service export cluster local-esque uh, style. And the other thing I wanna highlight here for MCS API integrations is the Gateway API, which is the new Ingress API. Um, this now, I've got an example over here from uh, GKE, um, but supports referencing uh, different types of kinds as uh, the background reference for ingress traffic, and it does support using service imports. So you could have your ingress traffic get routed to a multi-cluster service if you wanted to uh, using this uh, type of um, format here. So pretty exciting that you can connect uh, your uh, gateway API with your MCS API uh, in the wild right now. So diving in a little bit more into the cluster property CRD, uh, Jeremy mentioned before that it's um, about storing uh, these properties about a cluster. The cluster property CRD itself is very general purpose. It's just a name and a value. So you can store you know, anything you want in here. But the important part for the MCS API is that we want these two to definitely be able to exist. This id.cates.io, which is what we want to represent the clusters ID or name. And then this cluster set.cates.io, which we want to represent something that uh, describes the membership of that cluster in a cluster set. So the exact details of what that value is can be implementation dependent. We have a couple of recommendations in the CAP, for example, that you might use the cube system namespace UUID as your cluster's name. This has been discussed uh, by some other uh, folks in SIG architecture and around before as well. Um, but as it come, where it really comes as a CAP, is just to make sure that this uh, CRD exists, that the schema looks like this, and that if you do use this name idcase.io or this uh, name cluster set.case.io, that certain properties of uh, this resource instance can be assumed by users of the MCS API. So looks simple, but is very necessary for us to uh, be able to track this type of membership and also cluster names, which is useful for DNS. Great segue of myself because here is uh, some diagrams. I actually got four slides here that are pulled from a uh, deck that we've been using at SIG Multi-Cluster to discuss multi-cluster DNS. And um, I won't go super into detail, but I just wanna highlight uh, basically the different types of records that we're supporting with uh, the MCS, with the multi-cluster DNS uh, specification. Um, in general, the idea is that we make this DNS look very similar to how cluster local works, just make whatever minimal changes we need to that uh, make this work in a multi-cluster case. So you'll see this blue.test.svc.clusterset.local instead of cluster.local if you're used to using your cluster.local uh, DNS. Uh, this is the big change here for cluster set IPA and or um, quad A records, right? We're just changing out this zone. So this will still get you to the IP that can route to any of the matching backends, uh, just like you would expect for a cluster IP type service, but across the cluster set in the case of a multi-cluster service. And then we also support SRV records for cluster set IP as well. Um, if you uh, want to get this DNS name back, but are targeting a specific um, named port. For headless services, um, also, trying to keep it very similar when it comes to the uh, aggregate pod IPs uh, DNS. So if you wanna get back the pod IPs for every uh, backend for a uh, service name and namespace that has been exported across your cluster set, you can use the same uh, looking thing, right? That uh, you're used to blue.test.svc, but again, just changing cluster set instead of cluster.local. The place where this cluster ID I keep talking about shows up is here for uh, pod DNS for headless services. So if you just want to get to this one pod over here, or you just want to get to this one pod over here in cluster B, you need to know its host name, which is already normal for uh, headless services in the single cluster case. But you also need to know the cluster name because it's possible that the host name for this blue pod over here, blue one, is the same host name as this blue pod over here in cluster B, blue one, right? So if uh, it's 
possible for them both to be the same, we need some other way to disambiguate them. And that is where this cluster ID that we've been working on actually shows up. And finally, SRV records also exist for multi-cluster headless. Um, uh, this, I think, is a more useful use of SRV records if you want to know all the pod DNS names for all of the backends for HTTPS, you can use uh, this uh, SRV record to get all of these pod DNS names back so you can target all your backends individually. So I know that was a bunch of deep-ish, shallow-ish dive. I just wanted to show you that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. Um, if you do want to see even more, there is another talk, including demos, uh, that myself and Stephen Kitt, who's another member of SIG Multi-Cluster, have um, produced for KubeCon NA 2021. So it's called Here Be Services Beyond the Cluster Boundary with Multi-Cluster Services. Uh, should be published in a couple days here. Um, and it includes demos of the MCS API and multi-cluster DNS on GKE and OpenShift, so you can see it in action. All right, let's talk about how you can get involved in SIG multi-cluster, which we would, the three of us would love to see you here. Why don't we get that next slide? All right, we really need your input. Um, this is uh, basically, you can think of your input as one of our most precious natural resources in SIG multi-cluster, um, please let us know your use cases, your problems, and your ideas. Uh, you can see the, the home page here um, under, the, uh, under the community repo uh, in SIG multi-cluster, the Slack channel also unsurprisingly called SIG multi-cluster, and finally the list. Kubernetes SIG multi-cluster. Our meetings are bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 12.30 Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, and uh, 1,600 hours and 30 minutes UTC. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching our talk. Uh, thanks a lot. Hope to see you soon.